Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, it's our monthly visit with Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton. We'll talk about a variety of issues regarding Arizona's biggest city. And also tonight, we'll hear about a strategic plan to address the state's water future. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton joins us, visits our studio, I should say, each month and joins us to discuss issues important to Phoenix. Issues such as police involved shootings, light rail expansion and possible political conventions. Joining us now is Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton. Good to see you again. Happy to be here. I'm a happy mayor. Our Arizona Rattlers won the Arena Bowl over the weekend. Third championship in a row. We are championship title town for the uh, Arena Football Did League. Did I hear they had some sort of parade through town? Are they going to have a parade through town? Are you aware of a parade through town? We have organized a parade Wednesday afternoon at 4 o'clock downtown Phoenix. The parade for the world champion Arizona uh, Rattlers. All right, there you go. All right, let's get, let's get <laughs> to other things going on here. Um, a town hall of sorts, a public meeting, a, a, a situation. Thoughts on the shooting of this 15-year-old woman, a woman who was uh, being picked up for mental health issues. She winds up being shot and killed. Give us your thoughts on this. And again, where the city goes forward with something like this. We did have a very important community forum uh, yesterday called Bridging the Gap between uh, the Phoenix Police Department and the community. The more that we can communicate uh, with all people in our uh, community, all the wonderfully diverse uh, elements of our uh, community, leaders in the community, the more the Phoenix Police Department can not only communicate but be as transparent as possible, the better our city will be. Uh, I have met with the mother of Michelle Cousseau, uh, who was uh, killed uh, about a week and a half ago. Uh, I've met with other community leaders that are very involved in the case. Uh, and I've spoken with the police chief many times about uh, this matter. The police chief was at the forum uh, yesterday. The police chief, I am very, very proud of Chief Garcia uh, for the decisions that he's made in this case. He has moved the investigation from the Phoenix Police Department to an independent investigation with DPS, Department of Public Safety. That investigation will be reviewed by the county uh, attorney's office. So a request was made by Michelle's mother that we do have an independent investigation and the chief has requested that. In addition, he's asked for a full review of uh, our training uh, for our Phoenix police officers as it relates to their interaction with individuals with mental illness, including SMI, serious uh, mental illness. He's asked for a review of our protocols. So a great city, a great police department, a great city is always willing to look in the mirror and say, how can we improve? And that's exactly the process that we're going through right now. Uh, critics will say uh, seriously mentally ill or otherwise. 50-year-old woman with a hammer, shot and killed? Well, it, look, we have to go through the investigative process, and the mother of Michelle did ask for an independent investigation, uh, and so that's exactly what's occurring. So we're trying to get to the bottom of what the exact facts, the facts were. This, this uh, investigation will not only look at the facts, but whether there are any criminal issues that should be reviewed as well. I think the chief has appropriately handed over to DPS and given them uh, the full opportunity to look at this case from any way that they want to uh, review the case. It's a true independent uh, investigation. And look, our Phoenix police officers, obviously they have an incredibly difficult job, and they actually uh, go out every single day and have to uh, pick up people that have been adjudicated a threat to themselves or others and take into facilities where they can get the treatment that they need so that they can uh, uh, better manage their mental health issues. So Phoenix PD is put in this situation every day. We want to make sure that we're doing this in the best way possible, best for the individual that's being picked up, best for the Phoenix police officers, best for the community as a whole. And that's exactly what this review process is going to do. We want to be uh, engaging in best practices in the city of Phoenix. So we're going to be looking at what other cities do. And if there's a better way of doing it, we're going to adopt the best practices. If that includes, and obviously the police, they have so many things that they need to do and so many things uh, in which public safety is involved in this particular situation, Maybe mental health pickups? Do you maybe bring someone else along? Do you get someone who's not necessarily, you know, pure law and order, but perhaps has, a, has more skills on mental health pickups? Yes, uh, that's exactly what the chief and I, I've already met with um, leaders from the mental health community, and they've been very, very supportive of Phoenix PD, and they've also want to make sure that they have, if they have ideas on how to improve the protocols in this regard, 
that they offer the services from uh, community response networks, from our local behavioral health authority here in the region. And I know I'm looking for leadership from them and help from them. And I know Chief Garcia, who, I mean, I'm so proud of him for being such an open-minded leader about always looking for ways to improve. I know he's very open-minded as well. We don't wanna change policies very quickly. We wanna make sure that we're engaging in the, the best practices. Uh, so we're gonna be looking to the mental health leadership and community for ideas about how to better handle these situations. And that's exactly the process we're going through right now. Last question on this. There's an impression both here and around the country, and especially certain parts of the country, that police involved shootings are on the increase and that public trust in police departments is on the decrease. Uh, real quickly, as far as it pertains to Phoenix, are you seeing that? Well, um, look, um, there, there is uh, unfortunately always people who are going to distrust uh, law enforcement. And we've seen national headlines about this issue where it's played out, unfortunately, mm -hmm. um, uh, in a very difficult way in other parts of the country. I can only speak for this city, this chief, this police department. Uh, and I have full confidence that we are always going to ask the question, can we be doing more to build trust? Can we be reaching out even more to all of the communities of Phoenix, no matter what part of town, no matter what socioeconomic group, every single community in the city, every single person in this city needs to feel like uh, law enforcement is there to support them and uh, protect them. And if there are ways that we can do it even better, uh, I think we're gonna do it better. This chief, our chief has asked for a review for the last five years of every single shooting in which uh, there was a death. Um, it was a courageous thing for him to do, and we're going to get information to review each of those cases to find out what can we as a city, what can we as a department do better for the safety of the officers, for the safety of the citizenry as a whole. These are challenging issues. Mm -hmm. These are tough issues, but not issues that we are unwilling to tackle in the city of Phoenix. We are not unwilling to ask tough questions, and that's what great cities do. All right, let's move on now to light rail. You want to triple light rail. Why? Well, we have to. A great city, if we're going to achieve our goals as a city, particularly our long-term economic development goals as a city, we have to be a great multimodal city. By the way, that involves not just significantly increasing light rail, it also involves increasing bus service, bus rapid transit, the bikeability of the city, the walkability of the city. To be a great city, you cannot be a uh, car-centric city that is overly reliant on uh, automobiles. You have to have as many options for people as possible. And I'm telling you, companies that are looking to either move here or expand operation, those forward-thinking cities that are uh, on the cutting edge of providing the best quality public transportation are cities that are going to get ahead in the future, and Phoenix needs to be at the cutting edge. And we had Councilwoman uh, Thelda Williams on to talk about the, the four different ideas there, Chris down the Metro Center, one to the Capitol. Uh, as opposed to where they go, uh, and, and bus and street improvements are, are included, um, let's talk about how the city can afford it, because critics say you can't. Well, uh, when Mayor Rimza was mayor, he took a very strong leadership position on transit, did ask the voters to support a revenue source directly for uh, transportation, by the way, not just light rail, not just buses, but also bus pullouts, so the experience for uh, car uh, riders in the city would be a more pleasant uh, experience, and that was overwhelmingly supported by the people of the city of Phoenix. What we've asked, uh, former ADOT director, former Secretary of Transportation under the Bush administration, Mary Peters. There is not a better transportation leader in the United States of America than Mary Peters. She is leading our Citizens Committee to give advice to myself and the council on uh, light rail improvements, bus improvements, street transportation improvements, because with the recession, uh, we need to do more to catch up with street transportation improvements, and she's going to give advice to, the, to myself and the members of the council on how to finance it. Anything that we would do would have to go to the people of the city of Phoenix for support. Uh, so the, this will only move forward if the people uh, end up supporting it, and that's what we're looking to do. If they don't end up supporting it, I believe that tax, that sales tax expires in 2020, correct? Correct. If they don't, it sounds like you can only build about five more miles in the next six years, plus you'd have some shortfalls in what exists right now. Could be some cut. I mean, you're going to have to make a pretty strong case of those voters. Well, if we're not moving forwards on, on transportation, we're moving backwards as a city. Uh, and so, yes, if we are not successful uh, in getting a reauthorization of the Transit 2000 revenue source, then um, we are, light rail is not going to go away. 
but the amount of operations will go significantly reduced. Buses won't go away, but the ability of Phoenix, the center city, one of the largest cities in America to provide a high quality bus system will go away. We're gonna have a minimalist system. When it comes to transportation, you're moving forward or you're moving the other direction. And I believe that the people of the city of Phoenix are gonna to wanna to move this city forward. And, and there are some who say that when it comes to funding, you can either fund this, this light rail expansion and the street and bus improvement, or you can address aging infrastructure roads and sewers, water lines, they all need help now. That also indicates a major American city moving forward. Sure. This is a city, uh, when it comes to our water infrastructure, one of the things you brought up, um, we have an excellent water uh, infrastructure. Uh, and if we need to do more, we will do uh, more. So this is, not a, this is not a city that is unafraid or is afraid, excuse me, to uh, take on the issue of important uh, infrastructure uh, improvements uh, on, on uh, transportation. Look, during the worst of the recession, the legislature significantly cut back and in fact eliminated her funding. Uh, it's starting to head in the right direction. We need our friends of the legislature to understand how important transportation and street funding, street transportation improvements is to the entire economy of this state. That her funding, which is transport street improvement funding for the city of Phoenix, shouldn't be their piggy bank to balance their budget. Uh, it's a critically important funding mechanism for the infrastructure of the entire state. And so we're heading in the right direction, and I expect we're going to continue to head in the right direction. Last question on this. Critics say that the taxpayers subsidize and pay for 78% of light rail operations, and yet only 2 to 4% of folks in the city, in the region, use light rail. They don't see the balance there. Do you see the balance there? Of course. Uh, look, <laughs> light rail has been a massive success, not only from the perspective of those that use light rail, and by the way, ridership is already at 2020 levels and beyond. The amount of people utilizing right, right rail has been a huge success. But what critics also need to realize is that there has been $7 billion of investment along the light rail, the existing light rail line. Much of that would not have occurred without light rail being there. Light rail, done right, done well, spurs huge economic opportunity for the city of Phoenix. And the more we can improve public transportation, the more we can expand light rail, huge economic development benefits go along with it. And I'm telling you that when you recruit companies, uh, when you recruit entrepreneurs to move to your, to your city, they want to attract people that may not want to utilize vehicles as their mode of transportation. They want to come to a city that is um, forward thinking when it comes to transportation because many of their employees would prefer to use buses or light rail. So I'm telling you, if we don't move forward, we're heading in the wrong direction. Uh, before we get out of here now, uh, what's the idea? 2016 Democratic Convention, is that, is that real? Is that valid? I mean, considering it's a summertime event, you're gonna get a bunch of Democrats here uh, pounding the pavement at 116 degree heat. If the Democratic National Committee is smart, they will choose Phoenix for their 2016 convention. Unfortunately, we made a run at the Republican convention as well, mm -hmm. and we got eliminated too early uh, in that process. Remember, Phoenix was one of the final two cities along with Tampa for the Republican convention 2012. They in part didn't choose Phoenix because of weather concerns. Guess what they had in Tampa? Hurricanes. They actually missed a night of the, uh, of the convention. Look, we're ready for it. We have the uh, hotel infrastructure, we have the convention center infrastructure, USA Airways Arena is second uh, to none. With light rail and other public transportation improvements, we can host a convention of this magnitude and we can do it well. And if the Democratic National Committee were smart, they would see that uh, our convention center is right across the street from US Airways uh, Arena, and I will personally hold a fan for each, for each delegate who comes. So that 50-foot well, that, that uh, walk will be as cool as possible. You might be able to hold a fan, but why would Democrats convene in a red state? Well, number one, um, putting aside the politics, this is the right city to host a convention, but we're also a wonderfully diverse city. We are uh, soon to be a majority Latino city. We are one of the highest Native American populations in the United States of America. If you want to send a political message that your political support party supports the diverse communities that make up the United States of America, there's not a better city in the country than Phoenix, Arizona to make that statement. So not only is it good politics, but they're going to have one heck of a convention. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be convenient. And I will say that we will put on the best political convention in the history of political conventions if they choose uh, Phoenix. We are ready. All right. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Thanks so much.
Our continuing series on Arizona's future looks tonight at the state's water needs. The Arizona Department of Water Resources recently addressed current and projected water supplies and demands, along with strategies to help Arizona address future water issues. Michael Lacey is a director of the State Department of Water Resources. He joins us now. Good to have you here. Thank you, Ted. Thank you the for having me back. You betcha. The report now on Arizona's water future. What exactly did you look at? What exactly did you find? Yeah, the, the report is um, what we called a strategic vision for water supply sustainability. Um, we looked at the state as a whole and the adequacy of the existing portfolio of water supplies we have against the projected demands for the state. Now, Arizona not facing an immediate water crisis, correct? Correct. There are challenges to be met. Okay, not facing a water crisis in the near future, correct? Correct. All right. But there does seem in the report a long-term imbalance, I think the report used those words, That's a long-term imbalance between supply and demand. How long-term, how much of an imbalance? Well, once we reach that imbalance, um, we will be in that imbalance forever unless we um, develop additional water supplies to, to meet that demand. So um, the, the report looks at about 20 to 30 years as the time frame where we think our economic development will outstrip the available supplies that we have. So that's sort of the time frame that we believe um, augmentation needs to happen to bring additional supplies um, to the state. And as far as these projected demands for water in Arizona, is it mostly urban? Is it mostly because of development? Is there agricultural increase? What, what are you seeing out there? Yeah, it's, re it's really both. Um, we did not, as we put this report together, look at moving water from one sector to the other. So we didn't look at moving agricultural supplies to urban supplies, by example. Um, we tried to look at it in a way that could meet all water use sectors um, at their current use levels and then the projections. So, so largely the projections are in the industrial and municipal sectors. Um, we don't envision agriculture sort of getting much larger, um, but we do see them in the picture in the long run. If additional supplies are needed, where will those additional supplies come from? Some of those supplies will be developed internally within the state through enhanced watershed management practices, rain, um, um, rainwater harvesting, um, but and, and additional conservation measures, reclaimed reuse of reclaimed water. Um, but ultimately, we projected that um, we needed to bring in water from outside the state, and and we're looking at seawater desalination as that. Supply. I mean, that used to be something of a pipe dream back in the old days. Yeah. The, this, that concept was kind of laughed out of the room. Not laughing anymore. It's there's, it's not. It's it's in practice at many scales all over the world. And so, if it's in practice there, how long before something like that could be up and operational and impacting Arizona? It, it's something that could be developed within the next decade, um, but we don't need that supply that soon. We really need to put time and effort into building the case for uh, developing those supplies and then striking the deals to, to make that happen. As far as uh, you mentioned reclaimed and reuse, mm -hmm. uh, how, far do we, how far are we along now? How far do we need to go? We are um, among the leaders in the world in reuse of reclaimed water. Um, we actually, you know, all, uh, roughly 80% of the um, reclaimed water that we produce gets used in some manner. So we're doing a very good job of it today. There's pockets of the state where we could do a much better job. Um, and it is a supply that grows with additional supplies. So if we develop other water supplies, reclaimed water will be generated by that. And we think that this imbalance um, can be met by, as, by roughly 50% of this projected imbalance by an aggressive reuse program. So and when we talk about water banking and we talk about aquifers and these sorts of things, uh, again, where do we stand on those now and where do we need, and, and are we moving aggressively enough toward those kinds of things? Well, we have been very aggressive in our water banking measures. Um, there, is, there are eight and a half million acre feet of water in storage in central Arizona today through our water banking efforts and our recharge re program. Um, as water supplies tighten on the Colorado River, that's largely been Colorado River water that has been stored. Um, so we may be seeing ourselves shift from an era of storage to one of recovery. And, and that will, um, really change the dynamic of how our water management programs have worked. Interesting. And, and again, regarding the Colorado River water, obviously politics come into play there. That's yes, a moving yes, target and a moving yes, goalpost. Um, but the drought is also impacting things. Uh, again, that's an equation that seems to move a little bit, but it's not moving in the right direction. Well, um, it did last week in, in a, in a <laughs> yes, somewhat spectacular way. Um, we are in our 15th year of drought within the state and the Colorado River Basin. Um, 
whether that's a permanent shift in the way these systems operate or whether it's a, a temporary um, condition is is yet to be yet to be told um, but the supplies themselves I mean we do a very good job of, of managing those supplies internally within the state um, our Salt River project um, deliveries remain at um, at full allocation um, and our Colorado River supplies at least for now are are fully being fully delivered we're using our full entitlement I think I mentioned the drought because that's what people are impacted with the most they see it, it hasn't rained in a while when it does rain it goes crazy but yes. maybe not on their house and it's across those sorts of things but with that in mind people are consistently saying that Arizona needs to do something we are threatened it's not a good situation that we are in and yet again we're not facing an immediate crisis we're not facing a crisis in the near future uh, when, when people say that are they wrong no, they're, they're not. Um, we are really, our, our water management programs have been very effective. Um, the conditions that we find ourselves in are a function of how well we've done. The, so we have water in our aquifers today that wouldn't be there but for those programs. That water will sustain us as we move into extended gr drought and, and really get us to either the next supply that we develop or um, until climate conditions change to a more favorable uh, Level. And you mentioned, again, back to the ideas of, of additional water supplies. If the growth continues as we've seen for the past few decades, I mean, can there be additional water? Can there be enough of that additional water? Well, we have our assured water supply program that really is a, a governor on that growth. So we require 100 years worth of assured supply in order to develop subdivisions within the active management areas. So much of this projected growth actually legally cannot happen unless we develop the water supplies to make it happen and allow it to happen. And yet we hear concerns regarding people building wells and taking water out of certain uh, uh, rivers upstream where they shouldn't be or where you'd rather them not. How does that play into the equation? Um, it is part of the picture and, and as we, you know, if we live in a, an era of shortage, those types of um, disputes will continue and will escalate. Um, if we develop additional supplies, many of those arguments might be able to be managed by increasing the size of the bucket for all of us. This is such a complex issue. You've got state and federal laws, you've got land, you've got diverse geography. I mean, again, there are a lot of variables at play here. Are, are we ready to tackle that sort of thing? We are tackling. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. are tackling it. and. Um, and we'll continue to do so. Uh, Go ahead, please. Um, we are taking, so we're putting together an effort to advance the strategic vision. Um, we're actually putting together a group to kind of cement some of these ideas and put more structure to the recommendations that the department had put together in this program. And um, we're actually doing that with the assistance of the Morrison Institute. Um, we're gonna put together um, a group um, recommended by the, so membership will be recommended by the governor. It's going to be co-chaired by by Senator Kyle and I, and we're going to over the next few months sort of flesh out and prioritize the recommendations that we have here to sort of move this forward, um, sort of cement the legacy of Governor Brewer and having us put this together and create some order for the next governor to. Um, to step into the water arena without um, drowning in it. I, I, guess. I guess the goal would be to make sure this one doesn't uh, gather dust on a shelf somewhere correct, because correct. this is important stuff. Uh, I agree with you. All right, very good. Great information. Good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. And Tuesday on Arizona Horizon, it is primary election day. We will have results and analysis on our 10 p.m. show, a special Vote 2014 look at the state's primary election results. That's Tuesday at 10 p.m. right here on Arizona Horizon. Again, if you want any more information about what we're doing, what we've done in the past, and what we plan on doing in the future, check out azpbs.org slash horizon. That's azpbs.org slash horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.